So good morning, everybody. I think it's about time to start. Um, my name is Jan Greve. I'm from the Institute for Neurobiology from the University of Tübingen. And I'm, so basically I am a neuroscientist and on, on half time or spare time, I'm a um, part-time developer for open source tools. So I want to talk about the good and the bad sides of developing such tools for neuroscience and um, give you my ideas about these things, right? So we we'll start off with something that is uh, kind of serious or has become serious in scientific community. This is the reproducibility crisis. And I picked a few older papers that, that show these effects quite, quite nicely. So there is one paper sorting out the facts, the devil in the details. This is a paper or a short comment by two laboratories who try to reproduce their respective results. So they're working on the same thing, same methods, but they come up with different results. And, and the striking sentence out of this paper is our two laboratories quite reproducibly were unable to replicate each other's cell sorting profile. And they really took the time to try and figure out what is the problem here. And it boiled down to something like, it is a tiny detail in some protocols hidden somewhere. And this information has never been noted somewhere. The second thing is the gene or genetics group is rather advanced with respect to data sharing, tool sharing, etc. But even there, it is tricky to replicate studies, right? So in this paper, they try to replicate um, results by using stuff that was published in the public database. And the striking finding here again is the authors replicated two studies in principle, six studies partially, and 10 could not be reproduced. And they found out, so the main key was the un unavailability of the relevant data and metadata is the key point that hinders you. So we do have a problem with reproducibility in science. So, and it seems that information, background information, metadata, data about data is, is the problem here. Um, and the issue is that some information is hidden somewhere in, let's say, handwritten notebooks. And if somebody's supposed to read my notes, I think he has a hard time. Other information is hidden within settings and properties of the used hardware or software. Some is implicit knowledge that is somewhere hidden in lab traditions, right? This doesn't even show up in lab books. So I think that open source tools and standardization might play a key role to solve these issues and to overcome this reproducibility crisis. Before I go into our open source tool development stuff, I want to talk a, few, a little bit about what we do scientifically. So as I said, I'm from the Department of Neurobiology. And more specifically, we are neuroethologists. That is, we mean we intend to understand how the brain processes information in the context of the animal's own behavior. And our favorite study system is the e-fish or electric fish. And these creatures produce an electric field that surrounds themselves. And they use it for prey detection, navigation, as well as communication. I will just briefly skip over these things. But we can use this field, go into the wild, put a lot of electrodes into a river, which is the bluish line here, and then record the electric fields and figure out where these animals are. And this is shown by the, by the three different dots here. And each individual has its own frequency, so we can track it over time and space, which is cool because we then can find out how and who is talking to whom or interacting with whom. And finally, we can go and try to analyze the, really the signals and see. So each line here is an individual animal, and they usually keep a constant frequency. So the spectrogram shows time on x-axis and frequency on y-axis. And they keep it constant, except there's something happening, let's say an interaction with a different one. So they can produce communication signals. The second part of our lab is working with the brain itself. So we record 
the activity of nerve cells that process this information in response to something like, like a communication signal. Don't look at the details, it's just we record action potentials and see how do they encode this communication signal information. Or we do something like system analysis, like we play tricky white noise stimuli and, and, and figure out what range and frequencies can they encode and how do they do it. With this I come to, to the tool chain that we use and this is almost entirely based on open source. Some of these tools we, we, we produce ourselves, so there is the recording side. We use a tool that is called Relax for recording. We store information in open formats like, like the Nix tool or ODML. We use different tools for data management. This is Data Joint or the GIN platform developed by the GNode here. Um, and of course, we use open source in during our analysis and, and, and the code management, let's say. Let's go to the data recording side. So our, to our tool is, is Relax. It's, it's self-written by a bunch of people. The main uh, maintainer or developer is, is, is the head of our group. Um, so what we do with this is we record several signals. We store them. We, we filter them. We extract events like communication signals. We ex extract events like action potentials and store all these things. So and we, we run protocols like, for example, for a basic characterization of a neuron, we record how does it respond when we increase the stimulus intensity, what we call an FI curve. And as you can see, this is the dialog that allows you to set all the features of the protocol. And this is kind of diverse. So I can change it on the fly when I think this is, uh, I need to adjust the settings to that neur neuron that I just record. Um, or we have some other information that needs to be stored. Um, let's say information about the, the, the subject that was recorded or the cell. So Relax in itself is super flexible. Since we created our own, we have the full control over it. We can extend it by producing what we call research protocols or repros, um, and we can customize it and we can change flexibly or on the fly or even automatically what the stimulus parameters will be and adapt it uh, in a, a so-called closed loop fashion. And it features an, an, an hardware abstraction layer and real-time functionality. And these are two, two things I want to talk about in a bit. Um, and the thing is, it knows already a lot about the settings and the properties that we need to store along with the data um, to have it reproducible, or at least that we can recreate the conditions under which we were recording. So does that mean that everything's cool? Not really. There are certain drawbacks here. The code base is extensive and the abstraction levels make it hard for people that come into our lab or people that want to use that software to really jump in and create something they, of their, on their own. The whole software thing is maintained by a small team and they all, to some extent, depend on the main developer. And this is to some parts due to lack of documentation, which is due to lack of time, basically. And um, we also depend on some third-party software. So the whole thing is Qt-based. We use uh, 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 two libraries I want to talk about, the Comedy library and the Arti library. Um, and this leads us to some issues with our dependencies. So for example, the Comedy library, which is great. It's, this, it's a Linux interface for data acquisition hardware. So the boards that we have in the computer that transform the analog signals from, from our recording electrodes to something digestible by, by the software. But it is only run by a handful of maintainers and the hardware support depends to some extent on the hardware manufacturers. And um, some hardware support is, is therefore outdated. So I just ran into the situation that I thought I, I need to buy a new card, a new, new data acquisition board, 
and, and, and I looked at the, co at the documentation and see, oh yeah, it's supported, everything's cool, but actually the support is so outdated it doesn't work anymore. Good side, I can address the guy who did it and ask him and hopefully reactivate him to, to add the support. The second thing is the Archive library, which is an interface for real-time processing, and it's maintained by a really, really small team. Basically, it's, it's one lead maintainer who is a professor, uh, an engineer, I think, um, but he has, of course, oops, uh, very limited time. What happened here? I don't know. So this makes things really hard. I don't know. Okay. So what we do, do we learn from doing this kind of stuff? We develop our own software that keeps us very, very flexible. The code is open to everyone, so can, we can go back and check uh, how things were really done and, and figure out if there were issues. Relax and some of its dependencies are maintained by only small teams. That makes it critical, but it's only a free time thingy. And getting people involved is really hard. So this is something, whenever we hire a student to work on pieces of it, it's really hard. Um, and the neuroscience community, so we have some users outside of our lab, but they find it really hard to get accustomed with open source processes, like sending a pull, or to say to them, uh, oh yeah, implement and send a pull request is something they don't accept. And the final thing, which is, leads me to my second point, is we need flexible solutions for data and metadata storage since our tool is completely open to changes every time. So the second part is flexible recording requires flexible storages. And this is some efforts that we do together with the German Neuroinformatics node. And the team is slightly larger. I highlighted the ones who are most active, but this is not entirely true all the time. And we did two, two projects. One is called ODML. It's for storing arbitrary metadata in a, in a hierarchical format. <coughs> And the other one, Nix, is to a format or a data model actually to integrate data and metadata storage. And I want to talk about Nix for a few seconds. So the core idea behind this is to generate or come up with a generic data model that allows to store n-dimensional data irrespective of what the data is. So it can be doubles, it can be floats, it can be whatever, Boolean strings, and we want to be able to highlight regions and points of, re or of, points of interest in, in this data. Further, we want to be able to annotate it with arbitrary metadata in principle down to the single data point that we record. And one of the core ideas is that the entities carry just enough information that we can draw a basic plot of the, uh, of the data without any additional sources. So how does that look like? This is a little bit a part of the data model that is behind it. So the key element is what we call the data array. It stores this information and it stores information about what is in there, what is the unit of that stuff, of course the data itself. And then we have something that we call dimension descriptors that describe this time axis at this point here or anything else. And then we can have entities that are called tags that allow us to tag regions or points in this data. To make us independent of, of so we don't, want, we don't only want to store time dependent information, but it could also be something like a dimension, could be something like space or so. So we have, we have an abstraction there, we have dimension descriptors, uh, and I think I will kind of skip over them. They are meant for different purposes, something that is regularly sampled in time, something that is not regularly sampled in time, and this drives me nuts. I don't know what's gone. Okay. So, as I said, we want to be able to tag points and regions, and this is shown here. So basically we have the data, which is the blue line, as a function of time, and we can just store from where to where do we want to tag things. And this does not only work in 1D, but also, of course, in 2D or 
multiple regions in, in basically n dimensions. And with this, we can create then new entities. We can have this data stored somewhere. We can have the information for the events somewhere else, and we can combine it to something. We detected events in that signal. Right. And the issue is we are working with Linux. We are working or happy are happy with working with C++ libraries, but not all the people are happy with this. So we thought behind this project, it would be nice that we have a, we have a core library that is in C++, and the data can be possibly stored in different backends. So far, we only support fully the HDF5 backend. Most of you might know it. Uh, but we are a small team, so we thought it might be a great idea that we have this common library here and just maintain language bindings for Python, MATLAB, Java, whatever. But this turns out to be really tricky. And actually, the user is supposed to use something that is an, a, a specification of the abstract model to something that is domain-specific. And as you can see, it's really hard for us. It's really challenging to keep up with everything. So abstraction layers, what do we learn from this project? Abstraction layers make it hard to get scientists involved. So using a generic model is hard for them to accept. They, they rather have their domain-specific entities. And when we want to attract people to work on it, to, to, to join the project, we see that the attractiveness of a project depends strongly on the tool chain that we use. So Python is more attractive than C++. Further, when we try to find people for different projects, then we f figure out that, that UI development is much more attractive for them than working behind the scenes. Um, and right. Scientific communities are diverse and supporting large varieties of platforms and languages is really challenging, especially for us as a small team. And um, all of these things wouldn't have been or wouldn't be in the shape they are now, this is true for Nix and for ODML, if we hadn't had lots of support by the GNode and also Forschungszentrum Jülich. And the GNode actually pays developers to, to professional developers, full-time pro developers to, to go on with this. I think for the sake of time I will skip over these. Um, so as I said, we, we are using different open source tools for, for data management or code management. Um, and what can we learn from these? So I think there are projects that turn from a hobby to something like a, like a, a service or yeah, people make a living out of it. So open source does not need to be a hobby. And uh, I think there is a kind of a misunderstanding that open source is something that is for free. I think there is, open source does not imply that, that one may not try to make a living out of it. Um, using open source tools for data analysis allows us for tool sharing. Just imagine that you create, or large parts of our institute work with MATLAB. And they happily use all the functions that are hidden somewhere in toolboxes. But if you share this with someone else and this person does not have the toolboxes, they, they are actually doomed, right? They can, cannot run the code. And I think we need it. And access to raw data and the tools for analysis is really helpful when we try to do thorough reviewing of scientific results during the review process of a paper, for example. Right, so who does the work and who should do it? Um, should it be PhD students? I think there is a pro to it. Yes, they learn a lot about the setup, the protocols, and data handling in general, and they improve their skills on programming. On the other hand, they are on limited contracts and must become experts in their science and not necessarily in programming or developing something like open source. So should it be the postdocs or the senior scientists Again, yes, they know exactly what they want, what is needed, and when they have visited different labs, they also have some broader spectrum, and, and this experience might come in very, very handy. On the other side, the pressure for scientific success is even higher on this stage, and most are, again, on limited context. Senior scientists have little time due to different other obligations. So... 
professional full-time programmers? I think yes. The probability, they probably write code much better and much faster than I would do it. The caveat is, time's up. Yeah. Uh, funding agencies fund for software. They're happy to give you 10,000 bucks for, for buying specific software, but usually they don't give you money to hire a programmer. Um, we would love to have long-term maintainers that are involved in open source. And I think this would be really great if there would be kind of software workshops in institutions. So my take home message is open source in my understanding is, is the key for independence and innovation in sciences and to eventually overcome uh, the reproducibility crisis. And open source is also the key for data and tool sharing. One drawback, open source development la largely depends on volunteers and they do it in their free time. And uh, the way open source development works does not always work with the scientists who want to just use it. Right, my claim is we would need long-term support for open source tools in, in the sciences to co-overcome this. Finally, open source is definitely fun and I want to suggest to keep on hacking. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? We do have seven more minutes. Yes, I, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, is it able to get also raw data from the experiments that you conduct so that we can reproduce it and check out the open source tool works? So the question was if it, if it is possible to get the raw data from our experiments. Yes, we usually, or recently, since a few years, publish all the raw data together with some descriptions of how to read it and so on, actually on the GIN platform, so that in principle you could really go and dig into the raw data. And I think this is really critical. We had some experiences with published data where people found that there is a linear relation between two, two features. And they only showed the average of this, this thing. And when we go and eventually we could dig out the data, well, it was not the raw data, but, but some abstractive, but it was a, an average across trials. And each individual trial showed something like this, not the straight line. But since these individual low pass like thingies were, were shifted across trials, it showed up as a line. So there, interpretation, oh yeah, it's a linear relationship, this, is, this was actually not, not good. And I think this, this can only be dig, dug out if, if the information is somewhere available. Yeah. Is, uh, is it possible to play back the data? Is it possible to play back the data? You mean during, what do you mean with playing back the data? I mean we can, we can write a tool that, that makes a movie out of it. Is that what you, so what I mean is, like for example, you're recording the signals from a neuron, right? Yeah. And I understand you can store it and chart it and all of that. But can you take the data, is it stored in such a format that you can read it and then basically play it back and have, let's say, another program uh, read it? And I'm thinking if you, you can use something, some kind of like machine learning to, to, to train it to understand the playback of the data that you use. Do you see what I'm saying? I hope so. So, yes, we could play back the data to, so when, it depends how you store it. You can decide that you only store um, the events, for example, yeah, like the action times of the action potentials that were generated by that neuron. But since we always record the raw data in completeness, that it blows up the, the, the file size, but I don't know what we might use it for. Um, we could, in principle, play back the stuff, yes. And it's in nanoseconds, or like, I guess, how, how often? It depends. So what do you mean? The activity of the neurons is a millisecond range? Right, okay. Millisecond. So the relevant time scales are milliseconds or sometimes ten, tens of milliseconds. Yes. How does it compare to, like, for example, like the Large Hadron Collider yeah. type of data? Is it smaller, I guess? It's, yeah, definitely much smaller. I had a look at the uh, gravity wave data that was published, and it is very, very similar to such data, actually. It's just maybe a, a larger data set, but it's no problem for, for the storage or for the, the 
recording start side. Yeah. Yeah. What software license do you use? And is it really, does it, does it matter for you? So I think we, we published some software using the lesser. Sorry, the question was what, what software licenses we use and if it matters for us. So we use MIT-like licenses or, or, we, or sometimes we publish something under the lesser. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, if we considered having a joint endeavor with other communities, basically. Well, yeah, considered yes, time-wise, not really active. So we are part of the, um, there is, for the neuroscience side, there is the INCF, International Neuros Neuroinformatics Coordinating, Coordinating Facility, thank you. Um, and they try to bring th people from different aspects of neuroscience together to come up with something that is helpful for standardization and for common tool development. Uh, it would be awesome. Actually, the NICS project is not at all depending on neuroscience, right? It's not limited to neuroscience data. It could store anything. Um, but yeah, so far we were, weren't really active outside neuroscience. So there were two questions. One was, please correct me if I'm wrong, if we use in vitro or in vivo measurements. And the response is we take in vivo measurements. That is, the, the whole system is alive and at work with all the connections between the different areas. The second thing was oh, open hardware. If we consider using open hardware for recording, yes. And so we, we are kind of trying to use the teensies uh, controller boards, which do offer us some uh, enough sampling stuff, basically, but they are kind of tricky in our circumstances because of other problems. But yes, generally, yes, we would like to go. Thank you. We're good. Well, thank you. Thank you.